Um, I'm thrilled. Um, thank you, Professor Manat, for um, giving me the pleasure of inviting uh, you all to um, uh, Professor Subramanian's second talk in our exciting Yarshata lecture series. Um, yesterday, we discussed um, the idea of mobility, and I think today we're going to be continuing with that theme of connected early modern histories, um, but looking at it through the lens of particular figures and agents, um, quite different in many ways from what we discussed uh, yesterday. Um, of course, I think it's important before we start to, again, you know, be reminded of the fact that Professor Subramaniam, of course, has been not only doing history in a way that engages India and Iran, for those of us who work on it, but also Europe. And I think that's where we're shifting a little bit today as well. Not just um, what we do in history in terms of early modernity, but also how we do it. And it's been a model for many of us um, coming through the ranks, um, whether we're doing art history or intellectual history, poetry, and so on. And his work has really been instrumental to many of us. Um, I think you mentioned Jean Aubin yesterday, which I really appreciated as somebody who works on the Safavids, but I know you've worked closely with uh, Jamal Kafedar and Bert Fragner and all of these figures who've sort of been really thinking about this Persianate world as a connected world. And I'm excited that you've broadened it even further more recently in your work. Um, and I'm reminded, uh, of course, in the way in which you use these micro histories in a textured manner, um, not unlike Carlo Ginsberg and others, um, to really understand the worlds which they inhabited um, and to really give life to it in a way that I think is just really uh, remarkable and, and we're all very thankful for that. Um, one of these figures, of course, that you're going to discuss and I'm very excited about is Jerome Xavier, um, uh, the Jesuit um, who, who was a missionary and came to the courts of Abbas, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Akbar and Jahangir. Um, and a really important figure, not only for the text that he wrote, but I hope you'll talk about the painting. Uh, the illustrated Miras al Quds, um, and I'm very, very excited about this. So, so thank you for being here with us, and I won't hold up the the stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, today, um, my intention is to shift uh, somewhat geographically, but also uh, thematically. So. Uh, uh, the focus will move somewhat out of the Deccan, which is where we were uh, largely yesterday, and to another axis, which is much more a northern Indian axis, having more to do with the, with the uh, Indian Timurids or Mughals. And um, thematically, um, I uh, would say that broadly I'm going to shift to something which will be more of a discussion in the nature of um, a kind of inter intellectual history, actually. Um, now, um, this um, um, set of reflections um, uh, centers around uh, something which will be familiar, certainly, to some of you, and uh, hopefully, if it is not, will be so at the end of this hour, which is uh, the so-called uh, mirror for princes, uh, which is uh, a genre which was very widespread, uh, known uh, across a good part of the uh, Eurasian world, known certainly in the uh, Christian world, known certainly through the Islamic world, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, even even further afield, uh, the argument can indeed be made that uh, you can find it even in parts of uh, Asia, uh, which where the courts were not uh, were not uh, Islamic in their orientation, such as some of the courts of southern India or Sri Lanka and so on. So, the the mirror for princes, uh, Fust and Spiegel, for those of you who like to say it fancily. Um, these, uh, these uh, are, of course, um, uh, somewhat uh, mythic in a certain sense in their, uh, in their uh, origins. So for example, many um, of the stories about how this uh, genre itself came about tell us, of course, that this is the original occasion for the creation of such a mirror for princes, which is, of course, when Aristotle gave advice to Alexander. And Aristotle gave uh, advice to Alexander concerning what it was to be a good uh, king, what it was to be a just king. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, since, uh, as we know, uh, both Aristotle and Alexander continue to be revered figures, uh, not merely uh, in the Christian tradition, but uh, in a much, much wider sense. Um, 
I mean, I will remind you of the very large production in the last uh, few years even of my colleague in Paris, uh, Pierre Brion, uh, concerning the whole cycle of Alexander materials, uh, going all the way uh, actually through uh, his uh, recent book, which just came out from Harvard, the first European actually shows how Alexander was instrumentalized by Europeans in the 18th century to justify uh, their projects of empire. Uh, but he's also shown, of course, uh, what uh, Alexander was in relation, uh, for example, to the Achaemenids and, uh, and others. And, and we know that he was a figure who was certainly tremendously important in various parts of India, uh, southern India, um, northern India, and indeed uh, we know uh, in Bengali in the 17th century there's uh, quite an interesting set of materials uh, relating to the Sikandar Nama uh, genre, for example, example, written by the Bengali poet from Arakan uh, Alaul. Now, um, this uh, set of um, materials regarding um, mirror, uh, mirrors for princes uh, has been the subject of uh, quite considerable literature uh, amongst uh, analysts of the Islamic world. I give you just two examples of them. Uh, the uh, book on the right that you see over here, uh, Advice for the Sultan, which focuses much more on uh, the medieval period, uh, concerns, uh, on, amongst other things, materials in Arabic, but also uh, relating to the Seljuks and others who, in a way, uh, gave us uh, uh, the uh, kind of uh, prototypical works which were referred to later on, uh, Nizam al-Mulk, uh, but also what is... Um, uh, referred to and which comes down to the Mughals as uh, the tradition of what is sometimes called Nasirian uh, ethics. Right? And uh, my very good friend and collaborator, uh, Muzaffar Alam, of course, has written also quite extensively about this in this book. Uh, in fact, the paper which I'm presenting, the, the lecture I'm presenting today, is, is in large measure uh, the product of joint research uh, done with, uh, with uh, Muzaffar Alam. Now, in this uh, work uh, of, uh, of Muzaffar Alam, published about um, a decade or more ago, uh, he actually focuses on what he calls the texts concerning uh, akhlaq, uh, akhlaqi norms. Uh, and he uh, actually suggests that this was a uh, very powerful set of uh, materials um, for a number of reasons. But one of the things that he actually puts his finger on was uh, the idea that, in a way, uh, the problem of justice could be separated from the problem of religion. Right? And how and why could the problem of justice be separated from the problem of religion? The simplest way of looking at it would be to say that um, when uh, in the Mongol world, uh, Muslim uh, writers were engaging with uh, the uh, Chinggisid tradition, uh, the question which they had to face up to, and they began facing up to it already before uh, the setting up of the Ilkhanid dispensation, but certainly during the Ilkhanid dispensation, the point was, in some sense, could a non-Muslim ruler be a just ruler? This was not a anodyne question because it was a question basically, for instance, of evaluating someone like Genghis Khan. Was he or was he not a just ruler, despite the fact that he was not a Muslim? And indeed, they therefore looked to the fact that going back to antiquity, we had a situation. And in a certain sense, of course, this is exactly the same situation as that which is faced by medieval Christian theologians when they are asked the question, did Aristotle and Plato go to hell? After all, they were not Christians. So uh, in a certain sense, the question which arises over here is, uh, could the justice of a ruler be separated from the question of whether he was or was not a Muslim? And one of the things that Muzaffar uh, Alam actually tried to show was how very creatively uh, some of the writers in the Akhlaqi tradition coming out of Central Asia, coming out of the uh, Timurid dispensation, uh, and especially uh, at this very interesting fulcral moment, which we know quite a lot about, but which still remains fully to be researched, which is the court of Herat at the close of the 15th century and the early 16th century. Uh, at this moment, uh, the question of how one could separate uh, justice, uh, Adler, from, from uh, religion, and one of the ways in which they actually did it, which he tries to show, is, for instance, very creatively extending even the idea of what the Sharia was, to say that the Sharia is not what one literally thinks of, but it is, in fact, 
uh, any form of, uh, uh, of rules which allow you to uh, prosecute the business of good governance, right? which is, of course, uh, from a certain point of view, an extremely dangerous thing to say. Now, um, of course, the Mughals then um, came uh, into northern India uh, with this baggage with them. Right? So, so they already had this set of reflections which had come out of um, uh, the, uh, out of Timur's own court, then from the Timurid courts, then from Sultan Hussein Bekara's court in, in, in uh, Herat. And uh, in fact, when I say, uh, when they, they, they brought this baggage, sometimes they brought it quite literally. Right? So for instance, uh, a very famous text from the Herat court was uh, the Akhlaq e Humayuni. And uh, it was actually brought into and slightly modified in, uh, in Akbar's. Uh, court. Uh, other texts uh, survived. Uh, these include, of course, those famous uh, sort of animal fable type texts, uh, which were which uh, Abbas Amanat, for instance, mentioned yesterday, the Kalila Vedimna, but there are also um, others uh, which were broadly from the same family, uh, which were often taken again to be advice literature with, uh, you know, the animal fables very. Um, Superficial disguise for what was actually political uh, wisdom, which was being which was being uh, dispensed. Now, in the um, uh, court of Akbar, of course, we know that uh, uh, a um, a place was kept for argument, uh, which was um, argument on uh, the matter of um, ostensibly religion, but it was actually a place which was kept for uh, discussion in general. But this is probably the deliberate revival of, an, of a Mongol tradition. Uh, if uh, those of you who have, of course, read the famous uh, travel account of uh, uh, Guillaume de Rubruk, uh, who was sent to, uh, to uh, the Mongol court in Karakoram would recall this famous incident when Guillaume is uh, presented with others with whom he debates. So these include Eastern Christians, these include uh, Tibetan and other Buddhist uh, religious figures. Uh, he of course claims, as everybody always claims, that he won all the debates. Uh, but uh, we know that there was a kind of a, a tradition of such debate where the, the ruler was present and somehow mediated and sometimes uh, took decisions on who was doing well and who was not doing so. Well. So this is the kind of, of tradition that we have, which is carried over into the Mughal court. And in this tradition, uh, there are oral arguments, but there are also texts which are brought. Right. Uh, different texts were brought to bear. Uh, of course, um, uh, we know uh, famously that uh, Akbar claimed that he couldn't read. Uh, this is probably a strategic claim, but at any rate, he claimed he could not read. So all the texts had to be presented to him orally. Uh, and so even when texts, for example, the Jesuits, whom you see present, in this, in this painting on the left, uh, these are probably two of the Jesuits from the first mission, which means they are probably um, Rodolfo Acquaviva uh, and uh, either uh, Montserrat or, or uh, Francisco Enriquez. But um, uh, these Jesuits, in fact, we know they brought him the uh, Plantain uh, Bible, uh, which was uh, put away into the, into the uh, Mughal library. Um, so these materials were also brought uh, in terms of uh, allowing for uh, arguments to be made. Arguments regarding, as I said, religious matters, but also reg very wide-ranging arguments concerning all kinds of other things. Uh, for instance, we know that, uh, that uh, the Jesuits um, talked to Akbar concerning uh, the Portuguese rulers of the time, and uh, they presented to Akbar, for instance, the figure of the Portuguese ruler who had been killed in 1578 in uh, a rather uh, a tragic tragic light. So the presence of these Jesuits then um, added uh, a dimension, um, just as uh, in uh, the uh, 17th century Safavid court, later on, the presence of other uh, Catholic priests would, uh, would um, have a, a role of, of some interest and significance. Uh, the distribution is slightly different. In the Safavid case, uh, the presence tends to be much more of Augustinians and in particular of Carmelites, the most famous of whom is arguably uh, Per uh, Raphael Dumont uh, in the middle decades of the 17th century. But um, uh, you can see over here, this is actually a late painting. This is a painting from, the, from one of the Johnson albums uh, from, from pr probably, therefore, the, the uh, early uh, 18th century. You can still see here uh, the Jesuits uh, in a much less stylized manner, much more sort of chaotic and, and playful presentation of the court uh, that, you can, that you can see over here. <coughs> Now, this Jesuit presence, of course, then continued. 
It continued into the reign of the next monarch, uh, Jahangir, who ruled from 1605 to 1627. You can see over here one uh, little Jesuit figure who stands out. Uh, um, you, you can see him probably somewhat better in the enlarged version. This is very probably the Florentine Jesuit Francesco Corsi. And uh, this um, uh, uh, moment, uh, the moment of Jahangir, is particularly interesting for us because uh, we have a rich collection of Jesuit materials and letters uh, describing their activities and their interactions with the Mughal court and what they did there. But what is actually really, really remarkable for us is that now we have actually a counter account uh, of this coming from the Mughal court itself. Right? So we are no longer dependent on the Jesuits to uh, tell us uh, what they, uh, uh, what actually happened, and we are no longer uh, purely dependent on uh, the kind of, uh, of uh, reading against the grain strategy which someone like Carlo Ginzburg uh, once presented in a well-known essay of his called Alien Voices, where he suggested that there are cracks in the Jesuit text, and you can actually see things which the Jesuits don't even understand they're saying sometimes in their own texts. But what we actually have in the Mughal case, which is really interesting, is uh, a text which, is, which actually gives us um, then the possibility of juxtaposing the Jesuit point of view uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the other point of view. Um, this, of course, um, goes together with the representation which we have uh, in a number of Mughal paintings of individual Jesuits. Uh, the, this, there's uh, certainly at least a handful of them uh, sometimes it's difficult to identify who exactly uh, they were um, because um, of the fact that we don't actually have other materials which allow us to, <coughs> to get a clear, uh, clear sense of them. This is again a, a clearly one of the Jesuits who was present in the court in the uh, 1610s or uh, 1620s. I believe that it is today in the Walters Museum in Baltimore. Okay, now let me shift my focus. Now, in 1527, the year that uh, Niccolo Machiavelli uh, died in Florence, the uh, Portuguese, of course, had been in the Indian Ocean for about 30 years. Right? And uh, in the 30 years that they had been there, they had already uh, acquired a quite unsavory reputation. They first came into contact with uh, the Mughals probably in the 1540s or the late 1530s. Uh, at the time when Humayun was uh, around Gujarat briefly. Um, but this, uh, in fact, didn't have much of a consequence. Uh, we had to wait uh, till the 1570s for the Mughals to actually have proper dealings with the Portuguese. And when the Portuguese uh, came to have regular dealings with them, which actually happened to be through the Jesuits who were sent to the Mughal court, one of the difficulties that the Jesuits had was that they were uh, in a situation where they uh, were somehow required to explain um, the functioning of the Portuguese empire and what uh, the uh, norms and manners of actually practicing statecraft in that empire were. Right? Now, obviously, they were not going to tell the Mughals to read Machiavelli. Right? But in fact, we'll see in a minute that it's not quite so obvious as that. And in fact, it's an interesting question, and it's a question which has been somewhat debated, what uh, the text of Machiavelli had to do with Iberian empire building at that, at that time, right? So uh, consider these two great figures of Iberian empire building of the early 16th century. Regarding the one on the left, uh, Hernando Cortes, uh, John Eliot has, has written uh, in a very famous essay, I quote, that um, Cortes had an attitude to fortune, fortune with a capital F, fortuna, not unlike that of Machiavelli. And further, he knew that the man who aspired to master fortune must possess innate qualities of resourcefulness and guile, those qualities which for Machiavelli helped to constitute virtu. He then uh, proceeds in this essay to show how if you actually analyze the letters of Cortes, you can actually find very many tropes which are similar to the Machiavellian tropes. But then uh, subsequent authors have also pointed out that this actually really reflects the fact that both of them were drawing upon a common fund of resources. It's not actually as if there was any kind of textual contamination between, between the one and the other. 
In the case of the figure that you see on the right, who's often sometimes equated with uh, Cortes, which is the governor, Afonso de Albuquerque, governor of Portuguese India from 1509 to 15, he um, also has been sometimes described as being quote unquote Machiavellian in his perspective. There is a recent analysis by the Portuguese historian Angela Barreto Javier, where she actually shows or she, she argues that there are points of, of convergence between Machiavelli and Albuquerque in relation to such themes as the connection between force and political reputation, the best methods of conquest, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then uh, she again um, argues that, uh, of course, this proves nothing in terms of an actual influence or an actual um, termination. Now, um, where do the, um, uh, the, the strongest um, um, convergences uh, apply? If you actually read Albuquerque's letters, the very large corpus of his letters, uh, one of the interesting words that he likes to use and he uses many times is the word dissimular, hmm? to dissimulate. Hmm? And so, for example, he uses it in the, in the verb form. He uses it in uh, the noun form, hmm? uh, for, but he also uses it in, in, very interesting, in, a, in very interesting ways. For instance, he talks about how one of the things that he did was when he was facing difficulties with the rulers of Calicut in Kerala, he persuaded one of the members of their family to poison the ruler. Hmm? And uh, then he says um, uh, that um, I, I'm certain that so-and-so killed the Samudri with poison because in all my letters I wrote to him that he should poison him. Hmm? And I would come to peace uh, to, to, an, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to an agreement, and he calls this uh, as uh, uh, sometimes he talks about it as uh, uh, in relation to trisan, but he also talks about it in terms of desimular. Hmm? Um, but then he says, uh, and this is his interesting justification. He says that the reason why we are obliged to do this is this is basically how Muslims act. That since they dissimulate, we are obliged to dissimulate. Right? So in a world of dissimulators, the man who does not dissimulate is a fool. So the justification here then, which recurs time and again, uh, had become so well known right, that by the uh, middle decades of the 16th century, it's actually uh, uh, completely thematized in uh, um, Indian descriptions of the activities of the Portuguese. I'll give you two examples of this. The most famous example, of course, is the famous story repeated in a number of Indian texts which is actually, strangely enough, um, a story taken out of the Aeneid, right? which is the story of the foundation of Carthage, uh, where uh, the Portuguese go and ask someone for a piece of territory. And he says, you can have a piece of territory as large as the skin of an animal. But then what they do is they take the skin of the animal and they make it into a long thread. And then they use that thread to actually define the circumference of the space, which they now claim they can have because it is the size of the skin of the animal. And this is where they then build the fortress. And this is, for example, how they take Malacca or how they take Diu and so on and so forth. So this has become a regular theme concerning their duplicity. <coughs> Similarly, if you look at a quite well-known Arabic text written uh, against the Portuguese uh, in the 1570s called uh, Tofat al-Mujahideen, Fibaz Aval al Portugalin in uh, in Kerala, uh, it repeats again and again this uh, this uh, thematic of the dissimulation of the of the Portuguese. So this is a theme then which the Jesuits knew and which they were embarrassed by. Right? Um, the earliest Jesuit, let me remind you, of course, who came to Asia, the first generation of them came in 1542. Right? So these were Jesuits who accompanied the governor, Martim Afonso de Souza. And the most famous of that first batch of Jesuits, of course, was uh, Francis Xavier. Right? And this is his rough itinerary, as you can see over here. He comes and spends time in uh, Western India, in Southern India, in Southeast Asia, goes to Japan, and of course, then famously dies in a shipwreck of the Sea of uh, China, and then, of course, his body is mir miraculously discovered intact and brought back to Goa, where apparently it is still miraculously intact. You can inspect it minus a couple of toes which were bitten off by someone when it was taken out in procession. Um, now, um, this, uh, this, uh, if you read the letters of Xavier, Xavier, for example, is consistently aware of the bad reputation of the Portuguese. And he talks about how um, uh, there's, in fact, a famous letter which he writes to someone saying, uh, do not send your relatives to Asia. Because uh, what do we do over here? He says, uh, we just um, uh, 
we just uh, know how to conjugate the verb to rob, rapis, rapio, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is all that we do. We rob people, and we pretend we are doing good things, but in fact, we are the most immoral of people. Right? So this is something which is already present in some sense inside of the Jesuit discourse, much before, in fact, a good 25 or 30 years before they made it to the Mughal court. Now, when the Jesuits <laughs> actually made it to the Mughal court, therefore, they were fighting an uphill battle. Right? So they were representing a religion, to be sure, but they were also representing a secular power which was widely thought to be uh, untrustworthy and widely thought to be uh, characterized by this kind of constant duplicity and uh, lack of uh, trustworthiness, lack of capacity to keep one's word. Now, the Jesuits, of course, had various options. Right? So the first lot of Jesuits, we know, did not bother really to uh, get very far in terms of understanding uh, the Persian language. They functioned through intermediaries. They had some uh, Armenian intermediaries, the famous uh, Mirza Zulkarnain, uh, but they also had um, uh, um, others who, who they, they, they managed to, uh, to convert and who served, served them in this, in, this, in this way. But in the next lot of Jesuits who came after that first generation in the 1590s, uh, decided that they would actually invest in learning Persian. Now, why were they interested in learning Persian, right? So this is, for instance, uh, on, what you see on the left is the first le uh, lot of Jesuits. This is the generation of Montserrat, right? Uh, the Catalan Jesuit who wrote a very interesting account of the Mughals, but who clearly didn't know any Indian languages or Persian. But then the second generation of Jesuits who came included <laughs> this figure, who's uh, a figure who will play something of a role in what follows a man by the name of uh, Jerome Xavier. That's not his real name. His real name was Jerónimo Jerónimo de Espelleta y Gonye. Uh, but he was the maternal nephew of uh, Xavier, and so he took his maternal uh, uh, um, uncle's name because it was obviously a prestigious name by this time. Um, now, uh, uh, Xavier, or Javier, by the time he came to the Mughal court, was already middle-aged. Uh, he had studied uh, in... Um, uh, Spain, and he had studied in Portugal in the 1560s uh, and 1570s. Uh, he was not con considered to be a particularly talented or intelligent uh, individual. Uh, if you compare him with, uh, let's say, people of his general generation, uh, someone like the Italian uh, Matteo Ricci uh, or the other Italian Michele Ruggeri, who were both sent to China, were considered to be vastly superior intellectual figures to someone like like, like Xavier. But Xavier, eventually, one way or another, did manage to make his way uh, to the Mughal court. He was roughly, I think, 45 or 46 when he reached the Mughal court. And he and his companions then began to learn Persian. Why? Well, their initial idea was that they would actually produce materials in Persian for the consumption of the Mughal court. So uh, the materials in Persian that they wanted to uh, produce uh, were um, essentially religious mm, uh, in nature. So you see here, for instance, this is the Dastan Masi. Mm, um, and these texts uh, were meant to uh, actually give uh, the Mughals um, the quote-unquote authentic version of uh, the uh, uh, Christian scriptures and the Christian, the Christian uh, materials. Uh, the Mughals, of course, already had uh, extant uh, translations of uh, Christian materials, which had come to them often through Greek and so on, uh, but uh, the, the, the Jesuits did not actually uh, like them to use those materials. They preferred that these other materials should be, should be put in their place. And indeed, um, amongst these materials, perhaps the most successful uh, was this text called the Mirat al-Quds. Uh, successful in the sense that it's one of the few things which seems to have attracted the Mughals enough that they actually produced uh, uh, paintings uh, and, uh, and, and programmatic materials uh, around it. And uh, here you can see uh, a quite nice uh, edition uh, of this uh, text with a translation by Wheeler Thaxton, uh, which came out a few, a few years ago. Uh, we have uh, several, as I said, uh, illustrated copies of it, uh, including one in, in, in Lahore, as well as others in the United States. So these texts were meant for the Jesuits to explain their religion to the uh, uh, Mughals. But of course, they had very unexpected consequences. Okay. Now, here's one of the unexpected consequences. These Jesuit materials eventually fell in the hands of the Dutch. Right? And this is one of the earliest 
actually printed texts in Persian that one can find. Perhaps even the earliest printed book in Persian, actually. It's the, um, the <coughs> again, the, the Dastan-e hmm? um, But it's a very curious um, text because actually what it was, was uh, it's published in, in the Netherlands. It has, uh, it's a bilingual edition, so it has the uh, Persian text uh, produced ostensibly by Xavier, but actually we'll see it's more complicated than that. Then it has a back translation into Latin, right? Done by this man called Lodewijk de Dieu, hmm? who was a, a Protestant polemicist. And if you actually read the text, those of you who read Persian will notice what it says on top of it, right? Which says, um, uh, Dastane Masi Amma Alude. Uh, and uh, in fact, it, it actually says this uh, in a different fashion in the Latin text over there. Uh, uh, it says, simulke multimodis contaminata. Hmm? Uh, why is it contaminata? Because it, it, he's, he's, he, basically uh, Lodovic de Dieu's point is that this is actually a set of old wives' tales. This is not really Christian material. Uh, and what this man has done is not merely taken material from the Gospels or other things. He's added all kinds of stuff to it, which actually has no legitimacy in the Christian tradition. Right? And in fact, uh, he also did the same thing with another text, which <coughs> he also published at roughly the same time, which is called Dastani San Pedro, the story of St. St. Peter, again presented in exactly the same fashion. So this is an, 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 an unexpected uh, uh, negative, negative uh, uh, consequence. Of course, there is a much larger negative consequence, which we learn by reading not the Jesuit materials, but by reading this other text, which I've already mentioned to you, which is the counter text. And this is a text which is written by a man who for a long time remained in the shadows, but who now has become, it's become clear to us, was really much more important than we ever thought he was. And this is someone called um, Maulana um, Abdus Sattar, uh, Abdus Sattar ibn Qasim Lahori. And uh, he is someone who appears in, in every Persian text of Xavier. He usually appears towards the end in the colophon, sometimes he appears a little bit in the beginning, and so on. And uh, if you read the standard Jesuit uh, um, versions of it, including modern Jesuit authors, they will always say uh, he was a helper who uh, did a little bit of work for Xavier. Uh, that's the kind of impression that he gives us. But actually, it turns out that he was a much more substantial figure. And the way that we can actually understand what a substantial figure he was, was by looking at several of his own texts, but notably this text, which has very recently come to light and been published under the title, it's a modern title, of majalis e jahangiri where uh, it's, uh, it discusses the, the nightly discussion. So it, it, it says uh, that it's not the Rosnamcha, it's not the, what happened during the day, which is what the emperor wrote in his own diary, it's the Shabnamcha. It's what happened in the night, when uh, the emperor had informal discussions. And if you read that text, what Abdul Sattar tells us is that the Jesuits regularly came and regularly presented their arguments and were regularly reduced to mincemeat in the court. Hmm? that they were actually made fun of, they were actually uh, mocked hmm? uh, in various kinds of ways, even though they, of course, deployed their own mockery against the Muslim, Muslim traditions. Now, this mockery often um, was fairly crude. Hmm? Uh, it's of the type that you find, for instance, even in 19th century debates between Christian missionaries and Muslims in, in different parts of the Islamic world. But the mockery, in fact, took on a very different flavor at a certain point when Abdul Sattar himself turned against the Jesuits. And once he turned against the Jesuits, he actually was able to deploy a very profound knowledge of everything that the Jesuits had taught him in order for him to be help, uh, able to help them do their translations. Okay. And so he proceeded then to make fun of them at an extreme level of detail, saying all kinds of very peculiar things I'll just give you one example, which is uh, at some point there was a discussion of the famous uh, Noli Metanjare uh, episode, right? Which is the moment when Christ is resurrected, he returns, he's in the garden, he sees Mary Magdalene. And then um, she approaches him and he says to her, don't touch me. Hmm? Uh, and he's suffused with light. So um, there's a discussion of this episode. And um, when the story is recounted, uh, somebody in the court says mockingly, uh, why didn't she recognize him? 
I mean, he hadn't been dead a long time, had he? So uh, he says, well, he didn't recognize him because uh, he was uh, suffused in light. So then Abdul Sattar, who of course knew this text very well, said, but didn't you just tell us that she in fact thought he was a gardener? He was the Bhagban. And he says, yes, she thought he was the gardener. Says, so it's very common in where you come from for gardeners to be suffused in light, is it? Uh, how, does it how do you reconcile these different parts of the story which don't seem to really uh, add up as a, as a narrative? So he's actually picking his way through the little details of it, you know, mocking them at, at, at every point. Now, why is Abdul Sattar interesting for us? He's interesting for us not only because of the question of how he first helps the Jesuits and then turns against them and then uses the materials that he knows to mock them, but for an earlier moment, and it's to this moment that I will turn. This is the moment when the Jesuits are asked by Jahangir now to step aside for a moment from this whole set of proselytizing and missionary materials which they're trying to produce and instead uh, produce something else for him, which is a mirror of princess text. Right? Now, um, I will open and close a very quick parenthesis here. By the way, those, those uh, other materials which they produced, these missionary materials, also had, a, had another very bizarre afterlife because some of these materials were taken to Iran and then polemical texts were written against them in Iran in the 17th century. Those polemics were taken to Rome where counter polemics were written in Rome uh, by, by Christian missionaries. They were then brought back to Iran in the end of the 17th century. Uh, uh, a, an Augustinian who was converted to Islam called uh, Ale Koli uh, Jadid al-Islam then wrote even a further counter polemic to the, so, so you can see that Jesu the, this kind of Jesuit materials of Xavier had a, had a whole life of their own. But let's come back to this. This is the moment then when Jahangir <coughs> in his court says to them, why don't you produce a text about how kings, good kings are supposed to rule in your part of the world, hmm? rather than um, spending all your time uh, telling us these pious stories about you know, uh, the, 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 the saints and the life of Jesus Christ, and so on. And um, uh, we know that um, uh, Xavier accepted this challenge. But of course, he was not capable of writing this text himself. Right? Uh, as indeed, we know, if we start looking at any of these texts in detail, um, you begin to become very suspicious because these texts often have a level of rhetorical polish and a depth of references and cultural references which suggests that actually Xavier could not have been capable of writing them on his own. So in fact, all of these texts are co-authored texts. And let me also add a last point here, which is that after Abdul Sattar fell out with the Jesuits, Xavier's Persian production stops. There's no more Persian production, right? This, which is a very, very simple and telling fact. Now, what is the text that he then decided to produce? So this is the, the text that he uh, decided to produce. It's called uh, Directorio dos Reis, hmm? Manual for Kings. And this is how uh, it goes. It says, it's a manual for kings in which is treated how a king should behave in his government, composed by the father, Jeronimo Xavier of the Company of Jesus, addressed to the great King Jahangir, great Mughal, done in the year of our Lord, 1609. So 1609, 1610 is about the end of the collaboration with Sattar. It has four chapters. The first deals with how the king should deal with God. The second, how he should deal with himself. The third, how he should deal with his grandees and officials. And the fourth, how he should deal with his people. Right. So uh, <coughs> this is the, the summaries in, 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 uh, in Spanish, a very slightly Portuguese mixed Spanish. Hmm. But then the text itself, of course, is uh, mentally in Persian. There are two manuscripts of it that exist. Uh, the first manuscript it's called, uh, in Persian is called uh, Adava Sultanate. Uh, and the two manuscripts that exist, this is the, the Rome manuscript, which is the one he sent to the general of the Jesuits. And there is a second manuscript, which was brought back to by the traveler um, Gian Battista Vecchietti, and eventually wound up in London. Now in this text, the, um, when, when um, uh, Xavier was producing it, um, he may not have known, but Abdul Sattar certainly knew that he was presenting this to a court which already had a library of such mirror of princess uh, literature, right? So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Abdul Sattar certainly knew that the, um, of the existence of, whether it was the akhlaq nasiri or the siyasat nama or the akhlaq humayuni and so on and so forth. There were even three or four texts we know which were produced for Jahangir himself. 
the Moisa, Moisa Jahangiri is slightly later than this, but there are uh, there is a Aklahe Jahangiri, which is a reworked version of a text from Kabul in the end of the 16th century. So he's he's um, um, aware uh, uh, of this of this uh, of this fact. And furthermore, he's aware of, this, of the fact that when you're writing this text, you cannot actually fill it with Christian references. Right? So this text has to, in a way, step back from the Christian context and try to uh, present the whole problem of kingship as a problem which is not the problem of necessarily a Christian. So how does he do this? He does this essentially by working his way through uh, some general propositions, but then actually the whole text is constructed around exemplar and anecdotes and specific stories. And we'll see how these stories work. Okay, so how, here's how the, 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 uh, the, the text uh, begins. It says, um, roughly, um, the, the early, uh, early, I'm reading from one of the early sections. Hmm? Um, uh, it does have the standard, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Bismillah in, invocation, which, by the way, Xavier sometimes in the Christian texts doesn't use. Some of them in uh, the Christian text would say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are one God. Hmm? Uh, whereas here, he doesn't, he doesn't do that, right? Um, so it says, it's a beautiful duty to thank the governor of the world, before whose threshold hereditary rulers increase the fortune and capital of their grandeur and majesty by offering obe obeisance. It is astonishing, subhanallah, that even a stranger an humble dervish who has no interest in the world's affairs can presume to place the regulations of empire and the laws of, of rulership. Hmm? Before such a ruler of the world who with the help of God's grace and on account of the support of his high fortune has come to know the secrets of conquest and governance, etc. It's a very high, a nicely highfalutin language which um, clearly someone like Sattar can, can, can control. Now, let me get very quickly to what the materials are that he's now going to use. And it's actually interesting where he will go for his, his, his examples, right? So uh, as I said, uh, he um, um, cannot go to the usual places. Right? He cannot go to the habitual places which inhabit the text that he's already written, like the Mirat al-Quds or whatever it is. He has to go, he has to go in a sense. Uh, elsewhere, he has to step away from the religious context and move then to um, another, another, uh, another set of, set of materials, uh, materials which um, from time to time will be familiar to people in this court. Remember, this is a very cosmopolitan court. Right? Remember that this is a court that has present in it uh, people from Central Asia, present uh, uh, a good number of Iranians, uh, has people from the former Ottoman domains. Right? So it has uh, a, a fair diversity of people, but uh, it has on, only um, uh, really a, a small handful of, of Europeans uh, who, are, who are there. So where does he go? Well, interestingly, one place he goes is Roman history. So uh, there's actually a whole set of materials in the text which are actually derived from um, Roman authors. Uh, so um, uh, some of these um, are clearly identifiable, hmm? and it's possible that uh, Xavier probably had a modest uh, uh, Latin library at his disposal. So uh, Plutarch, uh, Cicero's uh, De Officis, hmm? and there's uh, uh, some, some other kinds of materials which I'll, which I'll come to uh, from time to time. But there is, as I said, a whole set of stories which are constantly drawn on Roman materials uh, from, of course, a period when the Roman Empire is not Christian, right? So for example, there are a whole series of anecdotes which have to do with uh, the figure of Baucusto, which is, of course, Augustus. Hmm? Um, and uh, similarly, there are uh, um, these, uh, these various stories uh, which concern uh, the Romans and their, uh, and their justice, uh, and in fact, um, how uh, they were actually interested in the uh, problem of uh, resolving justice. Again, uh, playing with uh, this whole uh, notion that uh, to be just is not the same as to be uh, of the correct religion. Right? So you, there's a separation of the problem of justice from the problem of religious belief. I'll give you an example of, uh, uh, of this. Um, it's a very curious story, which is actually the story of, um, of uh, the Roman conquest of Iberia. Uh, 
He, he tells the story at great length, which is the story of how the Romans uh, actually um, tried to conquer uh, Iberia, but they were resisted by this, uh, this uh, general who's, who was, uh, he's, he's described as the Sipa Salare Portugal, hmm, whose name is Viriatus, a historical figure, um, and how the Romans actually defeated him using deceit. So they made him promises, uh, they seduced him, and then they betrayed him. And then he goes on to make an explanation of this, and he says um, that uh, when the general who had done this came back, uh, the Roman authorities uh, reprimanded him, and he said, you have brought this land under our control, but you have destroyed our good name and honor. Nek nami wa abru. The pride that we used to have in our truthfulness has been now transformed into the, uh, into the humiliation of treachery. So this, this is again uh, thematized even in these stories from, from a Roman history where uh, it's suggested that uh, the Romans were proud of the fact that they did not use treachery, right? So which is the, the, the terms that are used, uh, for, for instance, are farebo uh, daga. So uh, these are these these this, this is the kind of thing which the Romans uh, disapprove of. It's even suggested when that when the Romans found themselves in a situation where lands were taken, they would give the lands back rather than keep them having acquired them under these wrong uh, wrong circumstances. But then he gets into some very interesting um, uh, discussions because he says, what is really the difference finally between treachery and um, um, what you could think of as um, uh, pragmatic wisdom. Hmm? Uh, where do you draw the line really between these kinds of, of things? Isn't it uh, uh, true, for example, that we can think of things like stratagems and trickery, hilava hmm? tilisma? And aren't these things all right? And where's the line really to be drawn between those kinds of things and these kinds of things? And <coughs> he suggests that, in fact, um, very often, uh, if one is actually too concerned with uh, the niceties, uh, you actually um, you, um, go, you're taking the line, you're taking the road towards what he calls bidani shiva supki. You're going towards stupidity and humiliation. So having set this line, this line which actually has to do with the idea of honor which has to be maintained, and truthfulness which has to be maintained, he begins to play with it. He constantly plays with it in these stories concerning Rome, in a large number of stories concerning Iberia, and of course these stories concerning Iberia are interesting because they begin with Roman times, but then they continue through the whole Islamic period in, in, in Iberia, and they eventually wind up in the 16th century. So there's a whole series of Iberian stories, uh, of which um, I will come to, to, uh, to, to uh, one or two, um, and um, constantly the, the uh, whole uh, sequence concerns uh, these kinds of, of, uh, of, uh, of examples uh, which, um, which uh, talk about how, um, uh, in fact, um, um, again, there's a thin line uh, between um, practical wisdom, hmm, the wisdom of kings, and uh, the, the line which actually goes into uh, what is uh, duplicity and what is actually uh, uh, treachery, treachery as uh, as such. Okay. Um, let me give you uh, just a couple of, of, of examples uh, of this. So uh, this is a, a fairly um, anodyne story. It says, the king of Portugal, Dom Sebastião, was going to fight a war in Ifriquia. Hmm? First he went to the king of Castile, Dom Felipe, and uh, requested him to send one of his experienced generals, the Duke of Alba, who had won many victories. He asked Alba if he would be willing to go with him on that war. But Alba replied, Sahib, please don't ask me this. Why, the king replied. He said, you should not take me. It so happens that whenever the Kaiser, my master, that's Philip, hmm, would take me along to war, he knows my nature. So he would hand over the entire charge of the army to me. Not only would the army be under my command, even the ruler follows me, even though he knows much about the matters of war. But here we have a different ruler, and Alba said that he feared that he would interfere in the matters of war. And since he was not intelligent enough to know that, it, that, that men who are capable should be left to do their work, uh, he didn't actually want to work for him. Right? So th this is the whole idea of the uh, uh, notion of a wise ruler who is actually able to delegate, uh, who is actually able to have subordinates who can function in an autonomous fashion, and unwise rulers who, because of their stupidity, are actually incapable of holding such men to them. 
I want to come to a last story. And this story, um, there's a very large number of these. It's actually constructed on the back of these, these stories, uh, which gives us a, um, uh, a sense of the, the, uh, the ambiguity which inhabits, inhabits this text. Okay? It's a curious story. It's a story which actually concerns the, um, uh, uh, not these, the, you can see there are a number of stories concerning these two rulers, uh, uh, John II, uh, who was actually known for being an extremely ruthless uh, king in Portugal, and Sebastian, who's normally taken to be the stupid, naive king. So the stories normally tend to vary on these uh, characterizations of the two. Uh, Sebastian was considered to be particularly stupid because he wouldn't take the advice of the Jesuits. Right? So uh, that was um, a further black mark, a further black mark uh, against him. Um, and indeed, uh, um, I should mention that there are a couple of amusing stories also about, about Columbus. Uh, which are thrown into this, as well as about uh, Cortes describing how the conquest of America took place and how uh, this was done not exactly by treachery, but by, by strategizing, both by the fact that Columbus, uh, for instance, the, the whole notion is uh, the story of, uh, uh, it's an actually an old story about how he, uh, he uh, makes holes in all his ships so that his men can't go back and therefore they're obliged to continue into the conquest because they have no way of, of actually uh, returning to the point of origin. But the story which I want to tell um, uh, to conclude uh, is the story then, as I said, of, of, of Toledo, hmm? uh, which you can see there to the south of, of, of Madrid. And this story um, essentially uh, runs like this. Okay? It tells us of what uh, the king um, of, uh, of uh, Castile, uh, Alfonso VI, who, when he was a young prince, was um, obliged to uh, run away from his uh, father's kingdom and took refuge in Toledo, which was at that time ruled over by um, Ali Mumin, uh, the, 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 local, the local sultan. Um, he was treated with great respect and embraced and so on and so forth. And one day, um, he was sleeping in a garden. Now, the city of Toledo had the reputation that it was impregnable. It could not be taken. And as he was sleeping, uh, the ruler, the sultan, was walking in the gardens along with his ministers. And his, the minister said to him, Sultan, can you tell us, is it actually possible to take this city? Do you actually know a solution for this? And the sultan said, yes, there is a way. And so he began to explain that there was a particular way of attacking the defenses and uh, if uh, the, the, the besieging forces had enough patience and so on, that they could actually uh, do this. At this point, the minister spotted this young man sleeping in a corner. And they said, wait a minute, this guy is a Christian. Hmm? And uh, you've just revealed to him uh, the way, the secret of, of, of taking the fortress. So the king said, no, 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 he's sleeping. Uh, let him alone. So th since the others were suspicious, they took some mica, they melted it and dropped it on him. And then he, he was actually not asleep. He pretended to awake with a, with a start. And so they were satisfied, thinking he was actually asleep and had not heard the secret. Of course, he then ended his term of exile, went back, became the king uh, of the other side, came back, and used exactly the secret that he had heard while he was a guest of the sultan in order to take the city. Right? So you can already see there's some moral ambiguity here, over here. But things get, get worse. Things get worse because. In fact, oh, that's the uh, famous, of course, um, uh, El Greco, I guess, of Toledo. So um, when he uh, was taking Toledo at the very last minute, because it was turning out to be very difficult, he decided he would negotiate. And the way he decided he would negotiate is that he told the Muslims living in the town that they could remain there as Muslims. He would not convert them, and he would not take away their mosque. They could keep their mosque. So they were left with their mosque. Some years passed. The king went off on his campaigns. And his wife, who was deeply influenced by the bishop, decided in his absence that she would take the mosque away and convert it into a cathedral, which she then proceeded to do. Now, when the king came back from his campaigns, the Muslims complained and said, you know, you gave us your word that uh, this mosque would remain a mosque. And look at what you, you have done to us, right? Um, at which point, uh, the king then uh, threw a fit, and he said that he would punish his wife. He, uh, he, he made a big sort of public clamor about it, uh, and he called for his wife to be brought out and maltreated and so on. Um, at which point, uh, the king's daughter, 
uh, went to him and said, no, no, you can't do this to my mother. This is a public humiliation. Uh, you know, this is terrible and so on. And she found a way of getting to the Muslims and told the Muslims that uh, you may think that you are being very clever at this point and you're humiliating my mother, but um, sooner or later, uh, we will get you. Unless you actually say to the king that you are willing to withdraw your request, and now that the thing has been converted from a mosque into a church, you are happy to allow it to be a church. Presented with these circumstances, the Muslims went to the Sultan and said, actually, we've thought about it. It was a place of worship. It's still a place of worship. We are willing to let, it, let matters go. Now, Xavier ends the story on this extremely ambiguous point, right? So here is a king who has gained the city through treachery in a certain sense, who has then proceeded to make a promise to the Muslim community of this city, who has then not himself broken the promise, but the promise has been broken. He has tried to revert to uh, uh, the situation where he kept his promise, but eventually at the end, uh, faced with the pressure, actually the Muslims are obliged to give up what had been promised them, uh, simply out of a situation where they had to, in some sense, uh, uh, preserve their skins in the, in the longer term. One is left to wonder what, when one read this in the Mughal court, one, uh, one, one, uh, one made of it, hmm? um, especially uh, given the fact that uh, similar circumstances, perhaps not with the same communities, uh, were available to the, uh, to the, for the Mughals to, uh, to, uh, to, to reflect about. At the end of the day, therefore, um, I've often been um, led to wonder um, what exactly both Xavier and Sattar were often trying to convey in this text. I started with this idea that the, um, uh, that clearly the Jesuits would not have wanted to, to uh, convey anything of the Machiavellian to the, to the uh, Mughals. But as I uh, continued to reflect on the matter, I started having my doubts. I started having my doubts on different grounds. First of all, um, I realized that actually um, Xavier was educated in Spain in that brief window when Machiavelli was not banned, had not yet been banned. He was first banned in Portugal, and then he was banned in Spain. But there was a brief time when you could actually read him even in, the, in, the, in, the, in a Jesuit uh, um, uh, monastery. Right? So uh, he belonged to a generation which would have read Machiavelli. Did he, did he actually want to leave um, anything uh, of that knowledge uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the people whom he was, um, he was uh, communicating? There's one reference little reference where he says, um, a famous man called Nicolaiu of Florence once said, and I quote, other things can be compensated for, but if an error is made in war, there is no way to repair it. The loss of honor is permanent, resu resulting in death and destruction. Now, it seems pretty anodyne. It could be a little reference not to the prince or the discourses, but perhaps to Machiavelli's art of war. But actually, looking very closely at his text at various other points in time, including in the, in the preface, there are actually passages which are very curiously, seem to be almost directly taken from the preface uh, to the prince uh, in self-presentation and in, in various other kinds of, 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 of ways. So what we actually get is a, a bit of a puzzle then where this Jesuit author, best known for his moralizing Christian texts, which often had exactly the opposite effect to that which he intended, when he's put to the task of producing this mirror for princes, produces a text which, again, remains incredibly ambivalent in its effects and perhaps even equally ambivalent in its intentions. Because um, whether he wished it or not, we could say that some traces of the order and perhaps even of the words of the Florentine managed to slip their way one, uh, in one fashion or another through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you very much for this incredibly informative and fascinating uh, 
discussion about how these two uh, s uh, cultures actually interacted with the Portuguese European and the uh, uh, Mughal Persian. What seems to me is rather interesting here is that what was the motive in the first place for Jahangir to ask for the production of a mirror for princes in the European tradition? Is this obviously it must have had some example of that uh, in the Mughal court, a number of them presumably were written for him. Uh, is this uh, some com kind of a comparative uh, study of methods of rule and uh, culture of kingship that we witness? Um, and uh, whether we know anything about the impact of this text, um, uh, whether uh, if there is a very famous story, as probably I'm sure uh, yourself and some people in the audience might know, that in the 19th century, when um, uh, the uh, Pasha of Egypt, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, was uh, presented with Machiavelli's text, and uh, was uh, proposed to him that it should be translated and published in Bulaq uh, 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 printing house. He uh, uh, somewhat paused and uh, suggested that much of what Machiavelli has said from the material that was pr presented to him is already very well known to us, so there is no need for, um, for the translation of this text. Is this some kind of a in the Mughal court, some kind of an understanding that indeed uh, this tradition of kingship in the European uh, context is pretty similar or parallel or a great contrast to the ideas of kingship as it appears in the political culture of the mirror for princes? Well, <coughs> first of all, let me say that uh, our problem, as is often the case, is the reception history of these texts is very, very difficult to actually get one's, one's hands on. I mean, um, one of the great things about that um, that majalis um, uh, Jahangiri of Abdul Sattar is that it's one of the rare instances where we can actually see uh, from somebody else's point of view. Because you know, the the Jesuits always tell us we brought out this this icon and oh, people fell on the floor and began praying and so on and so forth. Um, but I mean, you actually see a situation where this guy is actually giving you a completely different notion of how people are, are looking at it, are making fun of it, are pulling at it in this way or another, uh, pointing to its internal contradictions. With regard to this text, we actually cannot put our finger on the reception history. But let me point something else out to you, which is an interesting point, which is a, which is a much larger and difficult issue, which is this, that I pointed to you that the uh, Mughals had a clear notion of the, um, the Nasirian and uh, uh, um, various other um, uh, traditions coming out of the uh, Arab lands, out of Iran, out of Central Asia, and this was very much a part of their library. Of course, what is interesting is that exactly at the same time, the Mughals are also quite interested in what you could think of as the Indic political traditions. Right? So, for instance, they are interested in translating Indic texts, which also have, quote-unquote, political wisdom in them. Right? So, for instance, uh, there are chunks of, uh, let's say, uh, particularly the Mahabharata, uh, which they've translated as the Rasmanama, hmm, which um, contain uh, um, very clear discussions of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ethics, of um, political strategy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, uh, there's, of course, that famous uh, episode coming towards the end where this kind of elder statesman is on his deathbed and he gives wisdom to the, to the uh, generations, generations to come. So, in fact, the Mughal court is interesting in the sense that it's, it's really at the confluence of uh, the meeting point of different traditions of political, of political uh, thinking. And um, uh, in uh, the um, Indian vernaculars, we have what is sometimes called, and I've written about this elsewhere with, with Vilcheru Narayan Rao, Niti, which is a, a, a kind of an indigenous uh, political wisdom of some kind or another. And uh, we can actually see that um, for the Mughals, these were all uh, potentially uh, bodies of, 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 of materials which were to be, which were to be um, uh, drawn upon. Uh, so from that point of view, without my actually being able to say, here is a farman or a letter from Jahangir where he says, I want you to tell me this, this, and this, one can guess well enough what he had in mind. Uh, 
Um, what he probably would not have been able to uh, figure out, but again, it's very interesting. See, because I was puzzled in the beginning by the fact that this man keeps using this very strange mix of chronology. He goes back to the Romans. He mentions the Greeks sometimes. He has chunks on the Byzantines. Then he comes to Portugal and Spain in the 15th and 16th century and so on. And I was thinking about this and discussing with this with some of my friends who work on, on uh, similar texts in Europe. And they said, but this is exactly what Machiavelli does. He also jumps chronologically all over the place. He uses a lot of ancient examples. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, um, let's say, I think the interest of the text is that it's highly unlikely to me that Jahangir would have you know, micromanaged it. It seems much more likely that he would have given a sort of general set of, of, of indications. And uh, then it would really have been the kind of materials, first of all, uh, what he could do, and then I suppose it's perhaps a little bit a function of, a, of the, what, what uh, Xavier had in his library at that point in time. I must mention, by the way, that he invented one thing, which is that they, he has a long section which gives a so-called advice text from Mecenas to uh, Augustus. My um, colleagues who are specialists of the Roman Empire tell me no such text exists and that he made it up. Yeah. Uh, thank you again uh, for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, two uh, questions. Uh, uh, in the Indic context, will, would the Mughal library and court would have had access to Arthashastra? Arthashastra. No. Okay. Let's be clear about one thing. The, the, you know, there's a problem with the transmission of the Arthashastra, which you probably will right. be aware of, because you know yes. that the Arthashastra, was lost. Mm -hmm. as we have it today, was found in a very small number of uh, copies in the early 20th century. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, again, this is something which I've discussed with, uh, with Narendra elsewhere. Um, there is a, um, a tradition which is kept alive, um, which is not of the Arthashastra as such, but it's, uh, you will often find uh, people mentioning uh, what they call uh, Chanuraniti or Chanakiniti, uh, Kautilyam as an idea. And this is, this is fairly common in medieval times. Mm. So um, what is really retained in a way is the notion of an attitude. But, um, but certainly it's not one of the texts that was either uh, available to them Qua text, or certainly it was never translated. Yeah. Uh, uh, going back to Machiavelli, uh, I guess if the Jesuits had uh, were reluctant to bring Machiavelli to Jahangir, they probably had even less reason to introduce him to Machiavelli's play, La Mandragola, mm -hmm. which with its all its anti-clerical <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, tone <laughs> and substance of it. So I suppose in these writings there is there is nothing about Machiavelli's plays and other things like that. No, but actually again let me point something out to you, okay? If you were a Jesuit, I mean for example there is a Mirror of Princess text written by Erasmus. It's an incredibly boring text. It's very sententious and very boring. Um, they could have translated that they could have given him some version of that. You know, Erasmus was someone, something which was drawn upon. I mean, Matteo Ricci translated uh, bits of Erasmus on friendship into Chinese for the, for the uh, Ming emperor. But here, it seems to me that they seem to be torn because there seems to be, they don't want to explicitly say they're doing it, but there are passages, as I said, of the introduction, which are literally so close to passages of the preface of, of the prince that you really wonder what this man is playing at. So you get the feeling he's sort of being really coy with it. He's giving off a little bits of it. And I said that, that coded reference to Nicolaiu of Florence. Uh, he's doing this, and then he's also not doing it. Right? Uh, but certainly the, 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 the clerical question and so on and so forth is not, is not uh, at all at the center of this. Thank you very much. So maybe staying with your last comments about Machiavelli, I wanted to ask you, uh, 
I'm still mulling over uh, this uh, your your provocations, but what is exactly the boomerang effect of this uh, Sevier nephews back to the scholarship on Machiavelli? Because that's one of the purposes of your connected history. It has to come and hunt what we know about European history as much as everything else. So two rather uncontroversial things about Machiavelli. One is that the prince breaks away completely with the previous tradition of the mirror of the princes. Um, and the other one is that Machiavelli and Machiavellianism are completely different. And Machiavelli, I mean, there's still debate on chapter 25, but he had a very naive and hopeful feeling and that he was made into Machiavellianism, right? And so these are two questions that seems to, you know, haunt us in your presentation. I mean, your Xavier nephew takes Machiavelli as a literally, as a mirror to, as a book of advice in a very literal sense in which it probably wasn't meant to be or in a, you know, complicated way. And it makes him, uh, or it makes the advice uh, so that's the, I, I'm not sure how to formulate it, but you know, is he may is he turning Machiavelli into Machiavellianism, or is he still closer to that earlier, perhaps short-lived tradition of living of reading Machiavelli as Machiavelli and taking him in a more instructive, pedagogical, naive fashion? Um, I mean, what what are, what are we have to take away for? Um, for 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 the scholarship and the Europeanist version of what we know about Machiavelli from how this particular reading was done at the time. <coughs> so you'd be aware of the fact, of course, that you know in the Iberian context, you know, um, basically um, 1620s, uh, they with the with the kind of um, big push. To, for uh, razón de estado hmm? as, a, as, a, as a concept, uh, where um, what they're doing is, of course, um, uh, claiming to reread uh, other classical authors. Hmm? So, um, you know, um, a whole series of, of uh, some of whom are actually Jesuits uh, themselves, but some of whom are not Jesuits, um, are, uh, you know, writing these texts, which are actually leading us in the direction of what you correctly refer to as Machiavellianism, because Razón de Estado eventually becomes that, right? But I think that this is, uh, this is in fact, uh, uh, short of it, um, because I don't think that he has, um, um, uh, I think that he's in a situation uh, um, of, of intellectual isolation, um, and I think that he's providing us a relatively uh, naive, uh, specific um, uh, reading that he has from what his memories are of having read Machiavelli when he was being educated. So it's it's actually, st to my mind, uh, closer to that spirit than to eventually what would be uh, recognizable by the middle of the 17th century, let us say, as as uh, as um, full-fledged uh, Machiavellianism. It's actually, um, for me, um, uh, th therefore, uh, the really interesting thing is how I, I sense almost that, uh, despite himself, almost he's 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 pulled into he's attracted by this idea of of using this this uh, this text, but as a text, much more than having elevated it to some sort of a very uh, broad ideological um, uh, standpoint from which he can he can uh, he can function, which incidentally is not the um, you know, ideological standpoint of Xavier in general at all. If you read his other materials, for instance, you know, there's this small text probably written by him on the Mughal Padsha, which Georges Flores published not so long ago. If you read it, it's really, I mean, you can, nothing could be further from a, a Machiavellian spirit than that text. Right? So I would actually think of him as being much closer in a, in a sense to a naive uh, uh, reader, perhaps then closer, you might say, to the spirit of the author than to what he became a century afterwards or more than a century afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, this is really a methodological question um, because I think we all struggle with it. You know, so working on Safavid Iran, I have my Pietro della Valles and the Oliariuses and others who won't take their shoes off to go into a mosque, for example, right? So they draw very strict boundaries. They won't drink the wine because it hasn't been watered down, right? So they have very strict boundaries that they draw between us and them. And when I was looking at, and I, I don't, and I want to know a little bit more about what's going on in the Mughal case. And I was thinking of the two images you showed. Yeah. Um, one of the Akbar Nama in, you know, the sort of gathering of yeah. the, um, yeah, of the iba so-called Ibadat Ka, right? So, exactly. Um, this one, exactly, where we have the port, the, the, the Jesuits there. And then the, a subsequent image in which, so, you know, they seem to be one amongst all the others. You have the sort of clerics, the Hindus, and so on. Um, and here, in this case, where he's really pulled out, the Jesuit figure is in the history of the Mughals, and yet not, right? He sort of looks distinct. And I wanted to ask you, how do we use these sources in a way, how do we use their voices? I mean, we need the Abdul Sattar. We need the texts. We need the translations in a way to naturalize them into the histories of the Mughals. In the same way that, you know, Francesca, you're having a difficult time naturalizing it back or taking it back, perhaps, into the histories of Europe. Where do we fit these figures in? Because by by their own nature, by their own displacement, they're liminal. They really defy being naturalized because they are themselves sort of on the edges of identities, on the ed the experimental figures by definition. So how do we how do we really start to use them, or can we not? Should we just say that we can't? No, no. I mean, first of all, I, I um, let's let's also be clear about the fact that um, there are other people in the same boat with us. No? So, I mean, for instance, um, if you, I find it very interesting to see the evolution of the historiography on Matteo Ricci, right? Uh, to which distinguished former members of this university have, have contributed. Um, but if you actually read the last lot of, of writings, and I'm particularly thinking of the, the excellent book with a bad title by um, Ronnie Pocha Shah, uh, because he talks about what is it, Jesuit in the Forbidden City? He was never in the Forbidden City, actually, right? So it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, you can actually see what Ronnie Shah is doing there. It's actually giving you a very, very different sense of, of Ricci than the Ricci that we used to know a generation ago, right? And, and a very different sense of the nature of those exchanges, of those, of those, those uh, the, the intellectual context of that late Ming court than, than, than what, what we used to have. And I think that we are, in a way, um, in, in that, uh, in precisely that, that same uh, situation over there. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, I would actually say, I mean, if you push me to it, that you see, I mean, this is the current struggle which is going on. Sorry, let me find it. Because if you read this book, right, this book still represents that old tradition. You know, uh, uh, where uh, the person who is front and center, who only ha the only person who has any agency whatsoever, uh, is uh, in the affair of Xavier, right? Um, and and uh, basically, um, uh, everybody else is, is 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 effaced from it. He never asks the basic question of, you know, how is it that Xavier, who I mean, uh, you know, the, in, in in the Majalis of Jahangiri. Um, there are these various moments in which, in which uh, Xavier says something, and then Jahangir says, "I don't understand this guy's Persian," and so then, uh, then uh, Abdul Sadar has to step in and translate his Persian into Persian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 and, uh, uh, and he, he 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 at one point he says, oh, "I excuse excuse the padre for his kamdanishi dar zabani farsi." Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, now, to imagine from that point of view that this man is then, you know, in rhetorical control of this text is a little bit absurd, right? So I, I do think that, you know, once we actually think about that, and then we actually reintroduce this idea that this is a, these are all co-authored texts, but co-authored in very different ways, clearly, right? Uh, I, and I, and I have, as an experienced co-author, I can tell you that it's not a good idea to try to take a text and separate it and, and attribute this word to this person and that word or that sentence to that person. Right? But you can still see how, in each of these texts, this whole business of the collaboration plays itself out in so many different kinds of 
of, uh, of ways, right? Uh, and so there I think we are, we are on to something uh, in terms of actually figuring out what um, an intellectual interaction uh, uh, looks like. Uh, where uh, you cannot say, you know, I'm going to stay on the other side of the threshold because you have uh, crossed the threshold when you, when you are in the business of writing a text together. Um, thank you so much. My question is about the reception of the of the book. How was how was it uh, received by its readership? Because the kind of the morality that he's trying to promote is very is very different from the uh, from the type of uh, of advices that, for example, Nasiruddin Tusi has in his Akhlaq al Nasiri. So uh, where the king was the king, for example, shocked by or I mean. How was how he received the book, and, uh, and uh, th that's precisely the problem that I that I uh, don't think that, that the pro we don't actually have a, a moment when because you see in the Jahangir Nama for instance Jahangir never talks about how they came and presented him with this book and he read it and he thought this or that about it he doesn't say anything to us about that okay, okay. Um, now um, I mean I, I um, recently um, was presenting a version of this talk. In, in Emory, and there were a large number of Indologists there. And um, of course, I mean, uh, to come back to your question, uh, I mean, their response to me was to say, I mean, this is kid stuff. You should read Kautilya. I mean, that, if you want to know what real, uh, you know, vicious uh, uh, politics is, I mean, look at that. Hmm? Or, you know, for that matter, I mean, I mentioned the Mahabharata, which they knew. I mean, there are terrible episodes in the Mahabharata where the so-called good guys are doing unbelievably nasty things, you know. Uh, so in some sense, um, you see, this is the interesting question, which is... Um, because the problem is yeah. that the genre, the genre is the mirror of the prince. Yes. And for example, in the the uh, common uh, examples of that in Persian is Qabus Name. You never find such a story in Qabus Um He never tries to, for example, the author never tries to promote uh, treachery or cons conceit or s those kinds of no. bad habits. And Yeah, but l first of all, let me just make a small formal point, which is that um, he's not actually following very closely in the uh, formal construction of the text, the tradition of the mirror of princes, because the typical uh, Indo-Persian mirror of princes is not built on an edifice of exemplar. That's not, not how it's built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you don't actually go from one uh, exemplum to another to another with each one giving you something. Uh, they, they are set out schematically very, very uh, differently. Uh, they uh, often are uh, constructed at a much higher level of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and so in some sense, you can see that formally, um, he's departing from uh, any other received mirror of princess texts that would have been around in the Mughal court. This looks sort of like them, but it's not really like them. Okay. Uh, uh, this might uh, look uh, primitive, uh, but the language of the discussions which they had, if it was, say, Farsi, therefore the Jesuits were really in disadvantage. Um, therefore, uh, it was not a, a level playing field. No, it was not. Uh, therefore, how this problem of unleveled uh, situation uh, have been overcome or they try to uh, uh, make it more level? Yeah, um, you can see that various solutions were tried. Uh, but by the way, you know, the, um, uh, for everyone, it was a, a, a not a level playing field. You know, when the English ambassador, Sir Thomas Rowe, comes to the Mughal court a little later, I mean, his problem is that uh, he, uh, the only way that he can, can communicate with the Mughals is by using the Jesuits. And now this is an absurd situation where the Jesuits who are his sworn enemies are also supposed to be his translators, right? Uh, and, and we know that, you know, because Thomas Rowe was 
associated with Walter Raleigh, and he had fought um, to some extent in South America. He spoke a bit of Spanish. So he used to try to speak bad Spanish, and then the Jesuits would claim that they were translating his bad Spanish into whatever kind of Farsi they knew. And, and, and you can see an even more uh, not level, not level uh, playing field. Um, but you see, the whole problem is this, that mm, eventually um, uh, everyone's dream is to, um, is to abolish the intermediary. Right? And, and to somehow make it that uh, because the intermediary is always the untrust, untrustworthy person. But eventually, this is an, it's an impossible dream. Uh, even Xavier, who claimed that his, his knowledge of Persian was superior to, to those of many others, uh, was very far from being able to do it. Right? But that's the very nature of the game, right? It's the very nature of the game that you're placing yourself in precisely that, that position. And you are convinced that somehow the power of what you're saying is so great that you can overcome that uh, lack of a level, level playing field. Well, I hope you wouldn't mind if I have the second question for you. <coughs> Actually, going back to the earlier part of your talk, yes about the actual uh, text that, uh, uh, whether it was the uh, story of Jesus that mm. Dostan and Masi that was produced and so forth. Yes, this one. Uh, uh, the reception of that, as you very briefly pointed out, yes. in Safavid Iran was very different. Uh, a number of refutations were produced in Ulabuddin Alavi's very famous one, Moskhalu Safa, and a number of other works. Mm -hmm. These are very, in a sense, for me, it's rather remarkable because they were produced right around the time, 1620s, 1622 actually, when the Portuguese were expelled from the P Persian Gulf. Yes. And uh, it has obviously a very a significant political subtext. Mm -hmm. I wondered whether you referred earlier on to Tufat al Mujahideen. I wonder whether the texts that were produced in Mughal India had the same kind of a political significance or in their tone of uh, refuting the Christian texts, whether they would fall back on the religious tradition of a Mughal a court or whether you would see a different approach. Because in the case of the Safavids, is clearly Shiite approach, mm. and uh, they rely uh, remarkably on the Shiite text, although even in the early ones, if I recall from my reading of these texts many years ago, there were also an appeal to the uh, Jewish communities ah. in Isfahan in order to raise question with regard to the narratives that were produced by by the Jesuits to them. Yes. So uh, certainly this was the case in the later time, but even I think in the Safavid period that was the case. I wonder whether you would see such a nuance in the text uh, that, you, uh, th that you came across in the uh, Mughal court. <coughs> no, in fact, the curious thing, of course, is that while the polemics came about in the Safavid context, you don't find those, those polemical texts in the Mughal court in the 17th century. I mean, you, f you, f you find elements of that polemic in, in, in Abdul Sattar's account of the discussions, but you don't actually find a production of such polemical texts. Um, there's, um, I mean, I've written about this elsewhere, but there is, um, um, you know, um, a, a number of different sort of accounts scattered here and there of the Europeans uh, in the Mughal chronicles. I mean, the, perhaps the most extensive one is in a <coughs> text actually by a person of Iranian origin, uh, Tahir Muhammad Sabzwari, uh, in a text called Rosat al-Tahirin, uh, where he talks to, uh, he describes the Portuguese and their presence in Bengal as well as in Goa. He was actually the ambassador of the Mughals to Goa for, for a short while. Uh, he even has an account, a short account of the history of Portugal. Um, but it's, 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 uh, it's um, written in a, in a relatively, in a relatively flat tone. I mean, he says some not very nice things about the Portuguese. He says that they're very dirty and that they, they don't have proper uh, toilet practices, let's say. Um, they, don't, they don't wash as they should. Uh, but um, in general, uh, you know, uh, this doesn't amount to a full-fledged, uh, you know, a polemic of the type that you find in this Arabic literature coming out of the coast. Right, so Tawfat al-Mujahideen is part of a group of four or five texts. There's another text called um, uh, Fatal Mubin, uh, 
which is a text in verse. Uh, there are also uh, some other uh, Arabic texts which is now slowly people are starting to analyze. Uh, sometimes of a, of a theological nature or the need for jihad against the Portuguese and so on. Uh, so that's the, but the Mughal tradition, I would say, um, doesn't uh, bother to really take on uh, this thing, which in a way should have been a terrible disappointment to these people, because it means in a sense that here you are, you've produced all these things. Um, the Mughals find it interesting enough to have some illustrated manuscripts of it and so on. But in a way you are relegated to um, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the rank of, um, of curiosities. You know? So uh, you, you put these, 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 this is all part of Ajayi Bukharev. You know, uh, wonders and, and, and curiosities. It's not uh, as, uh, people who are posing some kind of existential uh, problem for you, uh, which of course would be the case in the 19th century. Um, you know, and in the 19th century it becomes, it becomes uh, something uh, of a quite different order and then when you have the Munazara, these debates and so on, that creates a whole, whole other other, other atmosphere. So, so in a in a certain sense, I mean, coming back to the to the reception question, which has been which has been asked, it's quite curious to see that that the the um, I mean, one even wonders sometimes whether you know Xavier um, by 1609 was thinking, you know, okay, all this religious stuff I've written, I've not been able to penetrate. Now let me try something else too, you know. Uh, and so he may have been, you know, eager to accept that invitation as a, as, as at least another way of somehow trying to get through, um, because he, he he was, you know, possibly aware of the fact that I mean, you know, it's around this time that they stopped this business, which they used to claim every year. They used to write back and say, the king is thinking of converting. He's going to become a Christian. You know, of course, the king never becomes a Christian. Um, thanks very much for your talk, and uh, I really like the intellectual history you provided and all these individuals that were brought up, but I was wondering if it's possible at all to have any kind of institutional history of um, this intellectual history and these individuals, and what I mean by that, it seems that across the reigns of various Mughal emperors, there seems to be some kind of interest preserved in either translation projects or historiography, which doubles as political theory or sort of political self-fashioning or self-reflexivity, so are there intellectual circles within courts, which can count as some kind of institutional body? Are there other institutions, educational or otherwise, which overlap with the court, but also have an existence outside, which preserve this possibility and this interest in both Indic texts, but also texts coming from elsewhere? And I think this brings me to a broader question of what is, dis what is unique about a big early modern imperial state like uh, the Mughals. Mm -hmm. um, and how do they compare to other early modern imperial states, which at various at heights of um, you know imperial expansion also become deeply interested in the historiography of other empires? And uh, I suppose another way of thinking about that would be what's happening in the Deccan Deccanese states at just at the same time or around the time of Mughal expansion into the south. Are there Portuguese figures or other itinerant European figures who are also providing similar texts or trying to? Uh, participate in the circulation of similar knowledge. And uh, so I suppose it's a way of asking whether big imperial states have a distinct kind of early modernity from smaller states or not, and sort of maybe asking a sort of question about structural causes of such knowledge projects. So sorry if that's yeah. um, no, you, I mean, I think that it's worth, it's worth stressing that uh, there is something distinctive about the Mughals in relation to some of the smaller states that, that neighbor them. It's not the case, for example, that you find such a uh, sustained uh, uh, interest or such a sustained set of interactions in the case of the of the Deccan Sultanates. The Jesuits come and go a little bit there. They never establish much of a, of a presence. Uh, you don't find this kind of, 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 of ongoing dealing. Um, now, um, with regard to the, to the Mughals, you know, we have now um, over the last uh, a good number of years uh, a fairly decent historiography with regard to, for instance, the Mughals and, and what you could broadly call Indic knowledge, right? So um, a lot of it is, 
is sort of summed up in, uh, for instance, the uh, book of Audrey Trishka on, on, on um, uh, Sanskrit in the, in the Mughal court, but it goes back to people like P.K. Gode and, uh, and Paul Dundas, and various people had written about it. So we know there were people both in the court and outside the court who were uh, functioning to uh, provide this sort of in, uh, intellectual um, uh, mediation. So it meant that uh, there were people who were learning uh, um, Sanskrit or certainly were learning uh, enough Sanskrit to work with people who really knew Sanskrit. Right? We know that uh, there were traditions amongst the Jains uh, of, of people coming out of specific monasteries who actually learned uh, enough Persian to function in the, in the two directions. And then we know that there were, of course, increasing numbers of uh, first uh, uh, of, of both Brahmins and then, of course, increasingly, as you get into the 17th century, and this is something which I've written about at some length with Muzaffar Alam, these traditions of, uh, of uh, Kayast and Khatri families, and, and the first student, Rajiv Kinra, wrote about this at, uh, at book length, where you can actually see that uh, there are familial traditions of people who become these kind of service people who, who understand their role as functioning in these two different language and cultural milieu. Right? So when you get to someone like Sojan Rai, Bhandari at the end of the 17th century, this is a guy who can actually read the Indic tradition and put it into Persian in a text like Hulasa Tawarikh um, and so on and try to reconcile. And, and by the way, and, and wind up therefore facing non-trivial problems. And I'll just mention something to you that very few people adequately in the Western intellectual history tradition realize that uh, uh, by the early 17th century, the Muslims in in India were facing the pre-Adamite problem because they had essentially come into contact with traditions which were giving them a much, much longer chronology of the creation of the world than anything which the Christian tradition or the Muslim tradition was willing to admit. And then there was a question of what you do with that knowledge. Or, or I mean, do you dismiss it? Do you actually make sense of it, etc. So in fact, I mean, the pre-Adamite question is posed even by Farishta in the beginning of his, of his, of his chronicle. Uh, and it's it's posed by Abul Fazal, it's posed by Sujan Rai, and so on. Okay, so there's there's uh, there's that. Uh, with regard to knowledge concerning the the uh, Europe, it's it's harder to figure it out, you know, because we have these little specific vignettes. Okay, so you know everybody who knows anything about Mughal history knows about uh, so Danishmand Khan, right? Danishmand Khan, who was this this uh, this Iranian who uh, became uh, François Bernier's em employer and who got uh, um, Bernier to translate uh, Descartes and Gassendi uh, into Persian for him, right? Uh, but the thing is that he was not a one-off figure. Uh, there's, a, there's a milieu from which, from which this comes. And we know that there were other people. I mean, for instance, if you read some of Bernier's unpublished letters, you know, he talks about uh, the people who are the, who, who's the best informed in the Mughal court about Europe. And he talks about people who, for instance, who have a good level of Latin in the Mughal court. Um, Abdul Sattar had a decent level of Latin, by the way. Um, and, uh, and clearly, uh, there are uh, you know, such, such uh, characters, whether you can track them and say these are actually families where this knowledge is being transmitted from one generation to another, it's still a bit difficult to say. I, I'll just close with that, your, my response to this little anecdote, which is, you know, when when William Norris, who is the uh, new East India Company's uh, representative to the Mughal court, shows up in the court, and then he tries to, to the Mughal say to him, explain the political geography of Europe to us, right? So then he starts. And then they say to him, so you represent the King of England. Now you claim that the King of England is bigger than the King of France? And he says, yes. Then they said, um, and but tell me, why is the King of England actually the King of uh, Holland? I thought you were enemies. He says, oh, well, it's a complicated story and so on. So, and then he realizes little by little that actually they're leading him up the garden path. And they know a lot about the specific history of political history of Europe in the previous 20 years, which they're not letting on to him that they, that they actually know. Right? And you know, there's that, the, the, uh, the, even a translated version of the document which he brings back uh, questions for the ambassador of the King of the Hat Wearers, right? Uh, and you can see all that, uh, that embarrassment, and clearly there is transmitted knowledge inside the Mughal court which, which, is, which is kept. Now, uh, we are not yet at a point where we can you know, give a, as convincing an account as we can of the people who did the Sanskrit uh, mediation. 
uh, all the people who who um, who did the mediation with uh, some of the other uh, uh, vernacular traditions. Uh, but it's not impossible, I think. It's certainly a task which somebody could set themselves. Uh, Professor Subramaniam, if I may, um, again, a fascinating lecture. And I wanted to ask you actually a long durée question um, as to whether uh, a case like this um, provides e any evidence for significant changes that are happening not only in the mirror for princes genre itself, but also in the notions of statecraft. Uh, specifically, to relate back to Salima's question, um, uh, to the ethical principles that actually underlie statecraft. And, and how this question actually came to me is when you're um, discussing uh, Jesuits producing a mirror for princes, um, and that too um, redacting any overtly, um, uh, let's say, Christian or biblical references from it, I was in fact reminded of my own work in the 18th and 19th centuries, where um, in which ulema and Sufis are producing a vast body of literature, none of which is actually mirror for princes. In fact, they're very particularly keeping themselves away from that from that domain. So I was actually curious that is there something that, that's actually new that's happening here in the sense that we're trying to find new ethical premises for what constitutes statecraft or redefining ethics to create a kind of system of, of, uh, of good governance, um, which may have a very different relationship, let's say, with the Nizam mulk or Juwaini mirror for princes tradition of, a, uh, of an earlier ulema age? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, it's an interesting question. It, in fact, it's a question you might say that Muzaffar Alam poses um, for himself in that, um, in that uh, book on, on political Islam. Um, um, he is, um, um, in a way, uh, more interested in showing the, um, uh, the creative ways in which continuities can be massaged uh, to, to, to work with, uh, with specific circumstances. And sometimes there are disconcerting things that show up. You know, for example, uh, when, when he found uh, reading uh, this text, which um, that actually um, this text is very largely simply lifted from a text called Akhlaq e Hakimi, written for Mirza Muhammad Hakim, the half brother of Akbar, in what is considered to be the great, very conservative court of, of Kabul in the late 1570s and early 1580s. But uh, this apparently text can move from this context to this other context without having to suffer an enormous amount of, of change. So um, the one way of, of looking at it is, I mean, I would say is a, is a, is a broadly um, sort of an, a problem which you always face in, 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 in Indian history, which is that, um, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're looking for um, uh, signs of very radical rupture where let's say you're looking for something like X genre is abolished, or uh, no one talks about this anymore and will only talk about something else. Um, it seems very rarely to be the case because actually what seems to happen rather is that you get a, 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 an accumulation so that uh, it's not as if the, um, you know, uh, the older tradition disappears. The older tradition uh, continues in some form um, and then the real difficulty is, is measuring up the bits and pieces that exist and coming to some kind of conclusion on how one balances out you know, the net effect of the coexistence of all of these, these various things. So uh, in a sense, you could say, well, you look at Jahangir's court and you actually look at the panoply of possible things that he had, which could be called mirror of princes or advice literature and so on. And it represents really a, a vast array of, 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 possible, uh, of possible positions, some of which are very, very close to, I mean, for, for example, um, I think it was uh, perhaps um, Professor Shaigan or someone who pointed out that the text that, you know, Sajda Alvi uh, uh, edited, the Moezai Jahangiri, that's actually almost verbatim taken from a text from a couple of centuries earlier. So it's, it's, he just, he's just taken it and fiddled it. He says he wrote it in three days. That's not very surprising. Um, and, uh, and so it's really a cut and paste job, mostly, with a new dedication and a couple of uh, uh, frills. Right? So you can actually see the, 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 the actual reproduction of, of uh, and, and indeed, you know, uh, the interesting thing is this, that uh, if, you, if you're writing a text at a certain level of abstraction from concrete circumstances, I mean, 
you're much happier with that when you're dealing with uh, making the text pass trans historically, right? So, uh, uh, so in that sense, I mean, uh, <coughs> I would say the the uh, uh, the way of searching for newness, you might say, uh, has to be a little bit different from assuming that what it means is that we have got rid of the old. <laughs>